The English language contains dozens of words that describe the dog. Yet none alone seems entirely adequate. Loving, loyal, devoted, amusing, spirited, tireless. How they enchant us, delight us, brighten our days. And how they work for us. Down through history, no other animal has served us in as many ways. Called by one philosopher the noblest beast God ever made, the dog is at work on farms and in pastures around the world. Across the forbidding reaches of the frozen north, as comrades on the battlefields of war. Seeking even the faintest scent of a buried victim of disaster. Or a hiker who has lost his way. And he is the devoted servant of the ill, elderly, and handicapped. We will never know exactly how this unprecedented partnership came about or when. But one story tells us, in the beginning, God created man. But seeing him so feeble, he gave him the dog. Every year since 1877, a stylized ritual has been repeated in Manhattan. The Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, the World Series of Dogdom. Some 2,600 dogs, all purebreds and prize winners in other shows, will compete. Westminster now welcomes 130 breeds and varieties. There are 52 million dogs in the United States. While some romp in the yard or sleep by the fire, others are being carefully primped and primed to take home ribbons. Right, 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 right. Oh, right, right, right. What do you say, Cuss? Try. Give me another kiss. Good boy. <laughs> You're a sweetheart, aren't you? That's $50. It's a show special, normally $79.95. Oh, you know what I just saw? Down there. <laughs> a charm holder with a Doberman head on it. Low sodium diet for your dog. It's an all natural diet with no added preservatives, colors, or flavoring. Oh, boy, that'd be great. Okay? I'll try that out on them, and if you live in Manhattan, there's a store that delivers for you right on the back. While most show dogs today perform no labor at all outside the arena, historically their ancestors worked side by side with man. In fact, our unique and splendid partnership with the dog began as a working relationship as long as 10 to 15,000 years ago. Over the centuries, many of their jobs became obsolete. One that has continued is tending sheep. In New Zealand, sheep outnumber people 20 to 1. And a saying goes, no dog, no shepherd. No shepherd, no sheep, no sheep, no wool or meat. 
With dogs at their side, New Zealand farmers now rank second in wool exports and are near the top in meat products. Some of New Zealand's backcountry is so remote, it is only accessible by helicopter. The dogs may not like the ride, but where the shepherd goes, so goes his devoted dog. Grant and Robin Calder run a sheep station on New Zealand's South Island. Grant is a champion breeder and trainer of sheepdogs in the tradition of his father and grandfather before him. Much of New Zealand is mountainous country, suitable only for grazing. Without the sheepdog, this would be wasteland. Working their 13,000 acre property with no additional hands, the husband and wife team herd 7,500 sheep. It's a fairly unusual partnership that husband and wife work a farm like this together, but thanks to the dogs, we can manage to do it. Without them, we just couldn't do it. We have two sons, but they're still at a boarding school because of the distance we live from a school. And so Grant and I are here mainly on our own for most of the year, and all we really have to help us is our dogs. A useless farmer could come onto this place with my team of dogs and work out how to work them and actually make a living here. But if you took my dogs away and left me on this place, we would be broken 12 months. Yeah, pup, 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 pup. Come on, I have to give you a name. One of the two types of dogs the Calders breed is called a hunterway. Grant begins training at about three months. Hunterways work the sheep from behind, facing away from the shepherd. It's the first signs of a pup starting to work is to go over there like that and chase those sheep. If I put a string on that pup, the noise would start coming, and that's the makings of a hunterway dog. A few sheep over there. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Even early in the training, a simple tug of the string keeps this pup facing correctly. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. This six-month-old pup is learning not only when to bark, but when to stop, once the sheep obey him or the shepherd commands him. Will I go, Danny? Will I go, Danny? Good boy. That's good. Good boy. The second type, working the Calder sheep, is called a heading dog. They virtually never bark, but control the sheep entirely with their eyes. She tries to mesmerize them. She can introduce herself quietly, looking straight into the sheep's eyes. <laughs> Twice a year, the Calders round up from the high country 2,500 of their sheep for shearing to send to market, or in this instance, to be dipped to protect their wool. Robin works on a high ridge and Grant is lower down as they and their 10 dogs begin to pull the flock together. Because sheep in New Zealand have no natural enemies, they have never developed a herding instinct and therefore spread far afield. The dogs are tireless and would literally work until they drop. It's not unusual in the course of a day for them to cover up to 50 miles. Over the years, man has channeled the dog's ancient hunting instincts into herding and driving behavior. The shepherds command the dogs with words or by whistling. They're just basic commands, a run command. You want him to run slowly, you can bury it. Left hand. Right 
right hand. job you got two commands to call him off one's well ago and the other one is well ago it's hard to believe how tough dogs are and on this property they work in extreme conditions in all types of weather even with a dog in those sort of conditions everything might be against him he might have cut feet he might have snowballs built up on him. They will always try and run. They will always try their best to do and complete the job that you put in front of them. Like army sergeants on alert, the dogs keep the flock moving. In one week's time, the remarkable team of two people and their ten steadfast dogs have completed the roundup. Dog's work's never done, and when he finishes on the hill, he comes into the real hard work of slogging in the hot yards. The hotter it gets, the more the sheep put their heads down and won't go. And we tend to only work with one or two dogs in the yard, so we can alternate them so that each dog gets a turn, because it's his hot, dry, dusty, dirty work. Because of the intense heat, the tired sheep often don't want to move, creating traffic jams in the tight confines of the pen. To find the offenders, the dogs simply make a sidewalk out of the backs of the sheep. After a chemical dip for protection against external parasites, the sheep will be set free to wander up to the high country again to graze until the next roundup. And then, once more, when the shepherds head for the hills, their canine partners will be by their sides. For us to spend a day on the hill, horse and dogs, the companionship and love and hard work that they give to us, you could never receive from any other animal in the world. Today, forward-looking New Zealand farmers are raising an unlikely animal, deer. The antlers are used in oriental medicine, and the market for venison continues to increase worldwide. Deer are more aggressive than sheep and harder to control. But the shepherd finds it no surprise that the versatile dogs easily meet the challenge. The New Zealand farmer and his dog have become a world-famous partnership. Today, more than 200,000 such dogs are on the job across the country. Probably the most photographed is this one, a public tribute to the dogs that help keep the economy so vital and alive. The origins of the domesticated dog lie shrouded in the distant past, but it is generally agreed that the dog evolved from the wolf, or that both share a common ancestor. Wolves and dogs have the same basic anatomy, physiology, and patterns of behavior, and underneath the dog's domestic facade lie the instincts of a predatory hunter. Wolves live and hunt in packs, Unlike other meat eaters, such as members of the cat family that ambush their prey, wolves stalk, chase after, and run down prey. However, as the wolf quickly learns, even with the cooperation of the pack, he is no match for an animal as large as a bison. The mainstay of the wolf's diet are animals the size of deer, small moose, or elk. 
Pack behavior is strictly regulated by a dominance hierarchy understood by all members. In the dog, pack loyalty is basically unaltered, even after thousands of years of domestication. The main difference is the dog looks to man as leader of the pack. Modern day scientists have pondered why early man, himself a flesh-eating hunter, would have turned competitors like wolves or wild dogs into allies. Animal behaviorist Dr. Michael Fox, one of the world's leading experts on wolves and dogs, has one explanation for how the partnership may have begun. Well, I feel that dogs and humans came together because of their similarity in lifestyles to the degree that we hunted in small packs, we were gatherer hunters, and the dog-wolf ancestor was like that too. And it's quite probable that the early hunting societies found that dogs were pretty good allies if they were properly socialized to help locate and even ambush prey. Dogs, in their long association with us, uh, have powers of manipulation. In one sense, we've domesticated them, but they have domesticated us too. We have the situation where the dog will come up and just look at you and look at you, and you have to feed it. Uh, the dog knows how to touch your heart. They have a power in the eye. Some people think that their dogs have ESP, that they know what you're feeling and thinking, but they're acute observers of our body language, you know, when we're depressed or happy or anxious. They're reading all that all the time because that's how they communicate with each other too. In finding out about each other and the rest of the world, smell is the dog's primary tool. It is said their ability to smell is at least 500 times greater than our own. Their hearing, too, is better than ours, but they see less well and are colorblind. There are 350 recognized breeds of dogs in the world. Regardless of outward differences, they are all the same species. Canis familiaris. Their wide diversity in appearance can often be explained by the work humans have bred dogs to do. In the language of his native Germany, Dachshund means badger dog. His short stubby legs and narrow body made him ideal for squeezing into burrows after prey. Terriers too were bred small and low to the ground so they could plunge into dark holes in pursuit of rats or foxes. The name terrier comes from the Latin word terra, or earth. Whippets and greyhounds are long-legged and sleek because they were bred for hunting and racing. Firehouse mascots today, Dalmatians, were companions to charioteers in ancient times. In Elizabethan England, they gained fame as coach dogs with a calming effect on the horses. The regal Chow Chow boasts a 2,000 year history in China as hunter and guard. For centuries, dogs have helped man hunt. Today, we've made them highly specialized. Pointers only point, nose high, body frozen in place. And retrievers only retrieve, joyfully leaping into even frigid waters to bring back their quarry. From predatory wild animals, we have created, regardless of breed, the most adaptable and sociable of all domesticated animals. It is not precisely known when we first put dogs to work as entertainers, but one of the most famous, adored by countless millions, is Lassie. Bob Weatherwax, son of the original Lassie trainer, is now preparing the seventh generation Lassie for an upcoming television series.
To get the seven dogs who have actually appeared on the screen, Bob and Rudd Weatherwax had to breed more than 200 collies to get just the right coloration, intelligence, and temperament. On screen, the Lassie character has always been female, but in reality, all Lassies have been male collies because males tend to have a more luxuriant coat and greater stamina. The Lassie legend began in the 1940s with a dog named Pal. Originally, Lassie and Jim hired their own collie to do Lassie, and it was a female dog, which is what Eric Knight wrote the story around, because it had to have puppies. And my father's dog was hired as a double dog, and it was a male collie called Pal. And I think he knew that the other dog couldn't do this performance. And they had a spot where Lassie had just come from Scotland back to England, and he had across a river, and it's a nice scene. The genius of Rudd Weatherwax came through in this scene in which he taught Lassie to look naturally exhausted, as if it weren't a trick at all. The mind of the dog, no matter how bright he may be, cannot conceptualize, look tired. But the dog can obey a series of off-screen commands, given in a specific order, that result in the tired look the audience sees. Stay. Stay. That's the boy, stay. Compared to many dogs that bring a large measure of instinct to their work, dog actors start out as a blank slate. Because they are intelligent, they are capable of learning. The motivation to learn, the willingness to behave in such undog-like ways, is based simply on the dog's desire for human praise. Dog's man's best friend. I think are the most domesticated of all animals, and they want to please. They want to be with man. It's like A for effort. They'll give you that effort. All right, come on. Up. Up. All right, come on over here. Come on. All right. The Earth's ice-locked polar regions could never have been explored without dogs. In the early 1900s, sled dog teams brought Peary to the North Pole and Amundsen to the South. When northern regions were settled, dogs became an essential part of life. Until the advent of airplanes and snowmobiles, dogs alone transported mail and supplies, pulled sleds, took hunters in search of prey. Today in Alaska, the pioneering spirit of that earlier time is celebrated in a grueling 1,100-mile race. Beginning in Anchorage and ending in Nome, it covers a distance roughly the same as from Seattle to Los Angeles. Its name, Iditarod, is said to come from the trail that was once the lifeline linking far-flung villages in the interior. Two-time champion of what is called the last great race on Earth is 33-year-old Susan Butcher, a world-class athlete and now a celebrity. She is going for an unprecedented third consecutive win. She hopes to beat her 11-day record and take home the $30,000 first prize. Yeah. I've been racing in the Iditarod for 10 years now, and I think over all the years, I've been basically in the top 10, and I think that all comes from my training ability with the dogs, and the time that I spend with them, and the conditioning that I put on them, and then the rest has to be up to the dogs. I've got good dogs and I bred them and raised them purely for long distance racing. Many observers feel that the time Susan spends with her dogs and the affection she lavishes on them 
are key elements of her success. As they approach the starting line, Susan's team will be the ninth to take off. 53 teams will leave at two minute intervals. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. I've really seen that the dogs love to race and know what it's all about. When they see a team in front of them, they'll pick up their pace and want to pass around them. And what I found out is they know then when there's no other team in front of them because there's no dog scent on the trail. In 1975, when she moved to America's last frontier, the adventuresome 20-year-old first lived in a tent, then single-handedly built a log cabin. She was 30 miles from her nearest neighbors, 50 miles from the nearest road. She started out with only three dogs, and today has a breeding kennel with 130. Susan raises only Alaskan Huskies, a line bred from Eskimo and Indian dogs. I changed the teams around today, David. Susan runs Trail Breaker Kennel with her husband, yep. David Munson, himself a champion racer. I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I've always felt I was born in the wrong century and in the wrong place. And so I kept moving north and west, and I've always loved animals, and they've been the most important thing in my life. And so I was looking to incorporate living in the wilderness and working with dogs, and I found the perfect thing.